Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming into the uh, the webcast this morning. We're doing things a little bit different, so hopefully everything will go smooth for us. And we've had a little bit of technical difficulties this morning, so we're working through those. But um, thanks, everybody, for, for joining in, and uh, we hope this will be uh, a worthwhile couple hours for you. We have it scheduled to about 12 o'clock today. And um, I want to point out this first slide here, this Kaibab Plateau Bison Hunter Clinic. Right in the middle of that is a bison hide that we had painted by, uh, by a painter. We'll get back to this at the end, but I wanted to show this. This uh, The bison culture of the American Plains Indians uh, recorded history of their tribes and stories on, on, on buffalo hides. And um, this story here that we have, we take around to different outreach events and, and show about our, our management of bison in the state. But it also depicts a uh, history of bison in North America and the two bison herds that we have. And I'll explain to this at the end of the presentation, but I wanted to show you guys this. Okay, so right now, a um, little bit of what we're going to do today. We've got four sections we're going to go over, kind of the background and legalities of hunting bison on the Kaibab Plateau, and then uh, bison and age and sex identifications right in the middle. That'll take about uh, an hour and a half to get through that, and then we'll go to questions and a quick break. And then we'll go over the actual scouting and hunting and techniques and then what if you get an animal down, what do you do um, after care on that? And then we'll finish with a, a questions and answers. Um, with that, a couple things I want to point out. We do have the fall uh, 21 hunter packet is back up on our website now. Uh, if you go to our website, you can click on uh, the hunting tab in the upper left. And then go down, I think it's a second row, second icon is um, species or game management. And, you, and that is bison. You click on that and that'll go to our bison management page. And on that, you can click on the hunter uh, information page. And that'll get you to that um, updated hunter packet. And then on that, there's the website um, that you can get to also. And that'll have all the updated hunt information and maps that we'll be going over today too. All right, so I'm Carl Lutch. I'm the Truster Wildlife Program Manager at a Flagstaff. Here today also presenting will be Alan Zufelt. He's our game specialist in Flagstaff. Um, I'll be going over the first part of uh, legalities and history of the House Rock Herd on the Kaibab Plateau. And then Alan's gonna go over identification I'll go over hunting strategies, and Alan will go over um, processing an animal um, on there. We do have a, a new member, uh, Sam Pogue. He's our new House Rock Wildlife Area Manager. He actually starts Monday. Um, I've listed our three uh, phone numbers there. Um, Sam will be obviously new and learning, um, so at least for the fall of 21, um, Contact Alan and myself and we can help you with any information that we can. Try to have full disclosure of everything that's going on up there on the Kaibab to help you guys to be the most successful that you can on these hunts. Also here today is Austin Teague. He's our California Condor Coordinator. He's helping to run our um, chat. So if you have any questions, um, go ahead and write that in on the chat and Austin will get that to me and or Alan. Also with us is uh, Ben Avachuco. He's our, our guy on the audio vid visual and, and making all this happen with us behind the scenes. So, all right, uh, just a quick shout out to Rush Jacoby and Corky Richardson. They've provided some photos that, are, um, that we have in this presentation also. All right, so just real quickly. So what is a, everybody talks about buffalo and bison, and, then, and really the words are interchangeable, but they are very different uh, animals. So just quite, what, what is that difference? So the true buffalo can only be found in Africa and Asia. That's your Cape and water buffalo, picture there on the right. So the buffalo and the bison are different um, species but they are a member of the same bovidae family when you get into the hierarchy of naming animals. 
So very different. They look at the horns and the whole body configuration is different than true buffalo. So the American bison consists of two subspecies, the plains bison and the wood bison. They are only found in North America. And uh, little believe that the name buffalo may have derived from the um, early American settlers for the word uh, buffalo, which is buff leather, which was a big byproduct of the early settlers and actually supplied leather for a worldwide market back in the 1800s. Um, also, there was some talk uh, that it came from French uh, settlers who called them buffalo. Anyway, a little bit of background there. All right, so a little bit of history of the House Rock and the, and the Kaibab Plateau. These animals were brought back into the state um, by Buffalo Jones in 1906 when he brought 86 animals to the North Kaibab. He crossed those with Galloway cattle to make a higher breed of livestock. That experiment didn't work out so well because of uh, the reproduction um, in crossing two separate species. Um, he finished that in 1909 and removed most of the animals, but some of the animals remained. And those descendants, uh, we bought the state of Arizona from a guy named Jimmy Owens in 1927 when the state bought 98 bison. And that's the, the descendants that we have today on the North Kaibab are these uh, of these 98 bison. Okay, so the first hunt that we had in the state was in House Rock Valley by the Arizona Game Fish Department in 1927 of December of that year. 1950, House Rock Wildlife Area was established as a place and a home for bison. That's on the Kaibab National Forest. And then up to 1972, the bison hunts were in pens in House Rock and House Rock um, Wildlife Area and Raymond Wildlife Area. In 1982, um, that management changed to the first open public hunts on House Rock Wildlife Area where the hunters were completely on their own. Um, there was a hunter orientation the night before the meetings or before the hunt opened and then the hunters were completely on their own after that. Similar to the, the, what's happening on the North Kaibab today. So in the mid 1990s, um, the animals had shifted, started shifting movement from House Rock Wildlife Area and their areas that they visited um, the Grand Canyon National Park when they first started showing up on top in the mid-1990s. 2009 was the last year that the bison herd returned to House Rock Wildlife Area in any number. They still had an established breeding grounds on House Rock Wildlife Area and that's the reason they came back. In the mid night, uh, about 1906, 1909, we did have some population hunts on House Rock Wildlife Area and that changed their behavior to switch from House Rock Wildlife Area to Grand Canyon National Park almost exclusively um, today. So over those last 15 years, we've tried a number of different hunt strategies and, and permits um, from spring draw permits, companion tags with a deer hunters um, on the North Kaibab can get a buffalo tag or bison tag at that time. We had these summer population management permits um, and they all had an effect on, on the animals. Um, in 2014, the hunt structure we have in place today, we basically started. And as a result, it's averaged uh, about 59 animals in the harvest compared to 22 from those other hunt structures prior to 2014. So the, hunt, the population um, or the harvest success increased uh, quite a bit with these new hunt structures, but there's drawbacks to every um, hunt strategy that we've employed over the years. So they said the fall 2021 bison hunter packet is up on the website. You guys can take a look at that and download it and print it if you like. It has almost all the information that we're going over today. Um, plus we'll go over more than, than what we can put in there today too. So. Here's the updated um, hunt success table. For this year, the first spring uh, bull hunt had a 42% hunt success. 10 out of 24 hunters um, were successful. 
Uh, the, the June hunt had 50%, we're six out of 12. And the current bull hunt that will end um, this coming Wednesday is at six that I know of that have checked out, um, six of the 12. Um, and I don't know if, if there's anybody still left out there in the field hunting or not, there might be. Um, and then, then your hunt, uh, we have today both all the 50 um, fall drawn hunters. We sent invitations to, and also the last spring hunt of 12 hunters that starts next Friday. Uh, we're invited to be on here too. So, all right. So, what are the legal requirements? What what must you remove from the field at a minimum to have with you to prove sex and species? All right. So, for a bull bison hunt, we're going to go over both what will what spring hunters and fall hunters um, will need to know. This presentation will be up for the next couple of years, probably before we do another one of these. So, for a bull bison hunt. Um, adult cow and yearling uh, cows are not legal, cannot be harvested. You need a proof of sex. You need either the head, the genitalia attached with a piece of hide, or pictures of that animal with you um, depicting that, that harvest um, to show species and sex clearly. Um, and most people is going to have the head with them and a hide, um, potentially the hide. But at least they had almost everybody, but not everybody does. And we've had a hunter in the past who just brought out the meat. He didn't want the head or the hide, and he was stopped and had no proof of sex or um, no pictures with him and uh, no head. So uh, no species or sex uh, to be all identified. And um, so that's why we just have the minimum of that. If that's one that is take the meat, you can, but you need some sort of identifier with you as far as sex and species. So for a cow bison only permit, adult bulls and yearling bulls are not legal, cannot be harvested, have with you either the head, the udder and genitalia attached to a patch of hide or pictures of either with you. All right, some pertinent laws, some things have happened this year that um, have been kind of brewing in the background and come to light. Um, so there was interference with, with rights of hunters. There's been some hunters who wanted exclusive use of areas and sites and locations on the North Kaibab. They were preventing other hunters from coming in there. They were blocking roads. So I just want to highlight some of these um, laws that are in place that are do not do these things. Um, right now, the, those cases are given to the county attorney's office with possible charges coming forth. We'll see where that ends up, but we hope I'm trying to um, we're trying to nip that in the bud so that hunters know exactly right up front what is legal, what is not legal, what they can do in the field to prevent these situations so that for the enjoyment of all hunters up there. And we'll go over that a little bit more in depth on another slide. But interference with the rights of hunters, class two misdemeanor for blocking, obstructing, impeding, or blocking, or attempting to block, obstruct, impede a person lawfully taking wildlife. So that would mean any other hunter any person, any hunter blocking a lawful hunter in the field could be guilty of that. Erecting the barrier without the consent of the landowner, that would be the Forest Service, Kaibab National Forest in this case, with the intent to deny um, ingress or egress coming or going on open public roads or areas, and then making or attempting physical contact without the permission of a person lawfully taking hunting. All right, also one uh, the point out is disorderly conduct. Person commits disorderly conduct with the intent to disturb the peace or quiet of a person or with knowledge of doing so, such person engages in fighting, violent, serious, disruptive behavior, uses abusive or offensive language or gestures. That's what's happened on the Kaibab this spring on a couple cases. Uh, to um, any person present in a matter likely to provoke an immediate physical retaliation. Uh, also, uh, it's a class six felony to recklessly handle, display, or discharge a deadly weapon or deadly or dangerous instrument. 
and that's a potential charge that has happened this year too so i just want to point that out um you know don't don't engage in these types of behaviors up there to, to har harvest bison and it's open public land it's open for everybody to be wherever they would like to be so that's where we want people to work together to communicate and to work things out civilly with each other as responsible adults so there is a checkout requirement hopefully you know that by now uh, what that checkout requirement is that each hunter issued a bison permit shall check out no more than three days after the end of a hunt regardless of whether you're successful unsuccessful or even if you did not hunt this is how we check um, on these bison hunts have a once in a lifetime harvest that's how we check that and that's why it's mandatory so please do that uh, there's no physical checkout you don't have to present it to us um, and you can check out online so you can go to the Game and Fish website, click on the hunting tab, go down to the second row of the hunting tab. I think it's uh, either the first or second icon on the second row, and there's the harvest reporting. Click on that and scroll down the bison. It takes just a couple minutes, and you know, get done, and um, that's all you got to do. Pretty quick and easy, simple process. All right, so what do you do if we wound an animal that gets on Grand Canyon National Park? Okay, so hunting's not allowed on Grand Canyon National Park. So if you legally wound an animal outside the park and it travels onto the park, you can retrieve that, but you first must contact Grand Canyon National Park. There's a number listed there, or you can go to the park entrance and tell them what happened and they'll get a hold of an officer at, um, from that booth and then um, you'll have to follow their directions. So they'll notify the park ranger and they will let you know how to proceed. Sometimes they come out and sometimes they don't, but they can give you direction. And they've even allowed anim uh, animals to be dispatched on the park. Um, those animals that are still alive but are gonna die at some point, they will allow that animal to be um, dispatched instead of just standing or, or waiting to die and, and, and um, hurting. But that's not the case every time and you have to follow the directions of what they give you. So there's no vehicle retrieval, you're gonna have to pack it out on the park. So, and, and what I'm telling you now, there's just guidelines, but the investigating park ranger has the final say on what's gonna go on. He may want, he or she may wanna come out and see a blood trail or where you were, what happened, and um, just take them out and show them that and, and follow their direction. But 99.9% .9 of the time, they've been pretty amenable to, to allowing the hunters go on there and, and collect that animal and get it off the park. All right, so retrieval on the Kaibab National Forest. What is allowed, what is the legalities of that? They do allow off-road retrieval with a vehicle of legally taken wildlife. As long as it's within one mile of an open road and one vehicle, one trip in. And that, that does include the meadows along um, Highway 67. With the caveat that it is dry. If it's wet and you're gonna leave ruts in the meadow, then, then that is, would be illegal. Um, so you're gonna have to pack it out of that. Uh, and the last couple hunts, the June bull hunt, and I believe this current hunt, uh, they'd have harvested several bulls in the meadow north of the uh, Grand Canyon uh, Park entrance on there. But they're usually fairly close to the road and um, but it is legal to retrieve on there with a legally taken animal. Okay, covered that as long as no habitat damage occurs. And then of course, if they're in a wilderness area, um, Saddle Mountain Wilderness Area, there's no vehicle retrieval in there either. Same as the park. So blood collection, we do ask, um, that's an ask, not a requirement to collect blood, we do some uh, wildlife disease um, test on the blood, um, mostly brucellosis, but we also test some um, other diseases, anaplasma, 
epizootic hemorrhagic disease, blue tongue, and bovine viral diarrhea. And the reason we do that is they are transmissible to cattle and vice versa. So we try to keep a, a, a health assessment on these this bison herd. Uh, do not freeze them. Um, just keep them cool. Um, freezing it or keeping them warm where they it congeals will ruin the sample and we can't do anything with that. Just keep it in an ice chest. And um, what I suggest, the easiest, most everybody will carry a water bottle, uh, plastic uh, disposable water bottles that you buy at the store. Just use an empty one of those, fill it. No, we don't need any more than a quarter of that uh, uh, water bottle with blood and um, just keep it cool and out of the sun. And if you can drop it off to us at our Flagstaff office and only drop it off there or have somebody else drop it off that would be coming through um, the Phoenix office and or any other regional office won't know what to do with that uh, sample. I said, went over that. We're open uh, Monday to Friday, eight to five. All right, kind of getting back to the legalities and, and do's and don'ts up there again. So hunting spots on public land are not reserved, cannot be reserved by any hunter or any guide that's up there who may have be may be hauling water, may be placing salts, may have uh, uh, ground blinds already up there. That does not reserve a site for anybody. It's it's it, it's ethics. It's not a law um, about first come first serve. So let me read this. This is in the rules, uh, page 14 of the 21-22 hunting regulations. Uh, it's common courtesy that it should be used when more than one person wants to hunt the same area or water hole, regardless of who has a tree stand or blind in the area. Confrontations and hunting situations can involve firearms and hot temperatures, hot tempers, rather. Whether you are in a city or next to a water hole, any threats, intimidation, assaults, or disorderly conduct can result in citations, arrest, and or jail time. Refrain from doing that. Lethal or ethical hunting is everyone's business. We encourage all hunters to work together. And that's going to be a theme that you'll hear us talking about is working together and getting to know the other hunters in the area when you're up there in the field and know where they're going to be. They'll know where you're going to be. They can help you remove animals from the field. If you get one down, you can help them or your helpers can help them. Also, if you break down in the field, they know where you're at and can come looking for you if you don't show up in camp. So most of the hunts have 10 to 12 permits. All the fall hunts have 10. The spring hunts have 12, except for the first one. Um, there's enough hunting locations to go around, and we'll go over a map showing the recent last couple months movements and then the winter movements, and you can see how they're, they're different. So team up with other hunters. There's no reason to not, especially on the cow hunts. There's herds of cows coming in where there's, you know, 20 cows available for one hunter. Um, two hunters can easily do it. They've been as many as five hunters have harvested from one group up there that has come in. That's when hunters work together. Um, and that's a behavior that is unique to bison that uh, once an animal is down, usually a herd will surround it and um, have other opportunities for hunters. All right, so for the spring hunts, um, at least in 2021, likely to continue in the 22, but look the regulations if this is after that date. Spring hunts, the northeast portion of House Rock Wildlife Area. And that's gonna be this green shaded area up on the upper right uh, of this that shows uh, House Rock Wildlife Area. That's where we brought in a new herd um, from Montana. That's our current House Rock herd. And um, there's a separate season for them now. Um, so those with the Kaibab 12A, 12B uh, permits are not allowed to um, go down there, there aren't not any other bison except those in that northeast corner on House Rock Wildlife Area. So the fall hunts, the whole of House Rock Wildlife Area is closed 
and that's to allow us to do, conduct those other hunts down in the House Rock Wildlife Area. And actually, this year will be our first harvest of cows and yearlings on this new herd that we're starting down there. All right, so a common question is, what's the population estimate? How many, how many bison are up on the Kaibab? Our current estimates are between 350 and 400 adults. And you see the range there. Uh, the Park Service has done a separate population estimate, and their numbers came in at 370. So we're, we're right in the same ballpark that are indicating um, pretty correct um, towards this 350, 400 animals in that. All right, so here's some miscellaneous information. You can go in on Grand Canyon National Park for $35 for seven days or $70 for an annual pass. Cheap gas is cheaper on Grand Canyon National Park. If you go down towards the North Rim, uh, much cheaper than um, Jacob Lake. That's probably the most expensive gas in the state, especially on diesel. Um, DeMont Park gas station is is fairly reasonable considered the location is cheaper than jacob lake uh, you might want to also fill up at uh, along the road coming up with a gap flagstaff um vermilion cliffs uh, all those are cheaper than than what jacob lake will have for gas all right so what i've been told and i don't know this exactly but i wanted to pass it along Something, if you pay the entrance fee, you can get into the North Rim campground, you can get potable water for a trailer there. Allows um, access to, um, to those facilities. There's a trailer dump station. Um, and like I said, the gas is cheapest on the North Rim Village. Um, there's also laundries and showers there if you care to, if you're up there for, for 10 days or so and um, if you're camped out in the tent might feel pretty good all right and one of the last thing is one miscellaneous information is there is a hunter camp co-op was called up there that a guide service does provide and just for full disclosure they will give you areas um, access to recent photos that they have on the sites of bison activity use of their blinds and um, you know, if you want to participate in that, that is available um, to you. Um, the, the department does not recommend any guide service or um, joining the co-op. That's completely up to you. We're neutral in that. But like I say, in full disclosure, just want to let you know about that opportunity. And um, many hunters um, partake in that. We also have a non-lead ammo program. You've probably seen ammo is in very short supply this year so due to that we haven't we, we've held back we're, we're going to supply the kaibab deer hunters when most of the condors are back on the kaibab and on gut piles or wounded deer we want to get the ammo we do have in hand to the deer hunters on the kaibab so it's not available to we haven't had it for the spring hunters um but will likely have a supply of ammo available to bison hunters in October and November. So Austin Teague, um, what's your number, Austin? Go ahead and just talk on that real quick. Yeah, uh, number is 928-2. Uh, Two four nine, or one two four nine. Sorry, one two four nine. Austin's fairly new too, so he's just learning. Um, this will be his first year of going through the the non lead ammo uh, program. So give him a call if you have an October or November um, hunt. He may have some ammo available to you, um, but he may not. In that. Um, just because of that ammo shortage this year. So the North Kaibab is home to the endangered California condor, and they're very susceptible to lead poisoning um, by ingesting the fragments from an animal carcass or gut pile. And that's why we have this non-lead uh, program available, free non-lead ammo program. 
It's not mandatory, but it's encouraged. And then, oh, here it is. I got your info right there. Um, so contact Austin if um, you have any questions. You you won't receive anything with your tag this year because we didn't know what the availability of the ammo was going to be, but um, we think we'll have enough to supply those 10, um, excuse me, 20 hunters or so at that time of year. All right, so Grand Canyon uh, National Park bison reduction. A little bit of updates on that. In October 17, uh, environmental assessment was finalized, which allowed them to um, start some uh, reduction efforts on Grand Canyon National Park. September of 19, they removed, captured and removed out of state to some reservations, 31 bison. September of t last year, um, they caught an additional 57 bison that were removed out of state, uh, also to reservations. So this year in late August, they're also planning additional capture. That's towards the northern end of, their, of the park there um, during the rut, which is going on uh, about mid-July to mid-September. Those animals will be in that area and that should attract them further north along the park boundary too. And I'll go over a map of, of that areas and with where to look for those um, animals at this time of year. September, October, they're gonna start a new uh, pilot program, a lethal removal um, with citizen volunteers. They have selected 12 individuals that will go out in uh, four groups of three uh, starting at the end of September to October. Um, the end result we hope will be take away the refugee effect, the safe ground, if you will, on Grand Canyon National Park for those bison to get them to move further north where hopefully they're available to um, hunters, lethal or legal hunters on the forest with permits. Um, the 12 um, it'll be likely one animal per day at the most harvested. That amount of pressure won't be enough likely to move the herd really that much onto the forest. But 2021 is just a pilot year. Um, and they'll continue that for the next couple of years with more um, individuals um, than just these 12. So the end result is to get the animals to move more, expand more off the park and take away that refugia. So you can Google that, um, Bison uh, Management on Grand Canyon National Park if you want some more information on that. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Alan. He's gonna take over uh, age and sex identification. This will be a time too for uh, any questions. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, just um, Go ahead and write those in to, to and Austin will will tell us about them and we'll answer those as we as they come up. Okay, well, it doesn't seem that there were any questions on that first section. Uh, my name's Alan Zufelt, the game specialist in uh, Region Two, and. Uh, uh, moving forward to this presentation about the age and sex identification for your bison, this is probably the most important thing to get right in the field. Um, you know, you've spent the money, you've spent the time, you've finally got drawn, and you need to harvest a legal animal um, to uh, be able to keep it. And uh, so we're going to help you with that the best that we can with this. Um, bison males and females bulls and cows yearlings look different from each other uh, but to an untrained eye maybe not as different as all that especially when they're in a group so we're going to help you kind of see the different characteristics of the different ages and uh, types so that you can have a successful uh, event so the diff some of the different things between the bulls and the cows and the yearlings on this picture right here before it gets covered up with words you can see a, uh, a younger bull, probably a three-year-old bull, um, large based horns, tall goalposts, kind of almost hor uh, vertical um, horns. 
versus a younger cow on the right side of the screen there you can see much smaller horns and uh, more of an arcing uh, um, horn shape the look at how much the facial hair is on this uh, bull on the left and the that afro kind of thing that's going on as opposed to the 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 less furry hair of the uh, of the cow and then also just the the mass of the head and how the cow has that long narrow face versus the bull uh, i just wanted to point that out before we put the words on the screen well you can still see them here um if a uh uh, on a bull, if you're looking at it from a broadside angle, an adult bull, you should be able to see that penile sheath um, under the belly right there. For a yearling bull, it may or may not be visible or may be very small. Um, obviously, on a female, you should not see a penile sheath. So, I um, already mentioned a little bit about the horns there. You can, you can clearly see that cow's horn will not get any bigger around it will just continue that uh, mass farther as she gets older um, the bull horn is much more massive and just continues to build as he gets older and older um, and uh, the shape of those horns uh, female cow horns are typically coming up in a a sort of almost a round uh, profile where the the horns of the bull are typically that much more goalpost straight up uh, kind of a, a horn. Uh, where that might change most would be in some of the older bulls where that will actually start to look a little rounded as well. But it is very clearly different between the bulls and the, and the cows. Uh, on a yearling bull, a horn will look like an ice cream cone stuck on the side of his head. Uh, where the uh, yearling cow, it also it already has that little bit of arc and turn in it, and there'll be some pictures to show that a little better as we're coming through. Um, talked about the size of the head. You know, you can clearly see even through all the words here the 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 size of the head difference and just how narrow the face is of that cow versus the bull. Um, the extra hair. Uh, and then just the smaller body. The reason, you know, if you look at a, a cow versus a bull, the bull has a much larger hump than the cow, and, and that is all the muscle that's being used to hold the big massive head up. And so if you have, uh, if you can see that big hump, you can be pretty sure that it's a bull. Um, but, you know, look at all of the identifiers. Don't just look at one thing. Younger bulls haven't had the time to build that heavy muscle yet, so they may look more like a cow even though they're still a bull. So you, you have to pay attention to everything. Um, oh yeah, the, uh, the neck. On a cow, you can clearly see a body, a neck, and a head. On an adult bull, you will not. It's just those shoulders straight up to the, to the head. Whatever neck there is is covered with so much hair that you won't be able to notice it separately from the, from the animal. Okay, so uh, um, calves are born earlier in the year before this fall hunt. And uh, as you're looking at this picture here, you can see uh, a young calf there to the left side of the picture, the, uh, that sort of orangish color. Um, Depending on what time of year that you're out there, that that calf will be that color, or it'll be turning more into the standard bison color. And and this picture is going to give you a pretty good representation of these different things that we were talking about on the last slide. So starting on the far left, you know the the that one that's kind of cut in half there, uh, that's a cow, and you can see just the one horn there, how rounded that horn is compared to that younger bull that is behind her uh, in that top left part of the picture there. You can see the heavy base and that goalpost uh, um, style of horn. You can see the, the, the penile sheath hanging down there. Um, so just as a comparison though, that young bull will be the one that uh, you would most likely confuse with the cow because he isn't um, so old to have that massive hump or anything, but you can still see the lot of the wool, the heavy horns, and, and the penis there. So 
Moving uh, to the next, so this would be the sort of the one to the left of the middle of the picture here. Uh, you have a, a yearling cow in behind this adult cow. Um, you can clearly see the difference in the size of the horns between the, those two. Now, if you have a cow tag, um, you obviously you're going to be wanting to try to shoot a, an adult cow. Um, this would not be a great shot to take because one, the animal's in the wrong orientation, and, and two, it's got something behind it. So, if you look over her back, uh, there are two more young bulls on the top right of the of the screen there, and you can just see that from their horns and the hump that's developed up there. Um, but but this is going to be the kind of thing you're having to look through while you are uh, on your hunt. Um, so specifically to the cows, when they are sideways uh, to you broadside, you will not see a penis. There will be no penile sheath. There's no junk. <laughs> um, the horns, when they face you, are very thin at the base relatively relative to the uh, bulls. Um, that curve we've talked about is, is more, very much more rounded, the narrow face, and, and less woolly than the adult males are going to be. So here's what we're talking about right here. The, uh, oh, I just handed a thing. I can show people things. I didn't realize I used the mouse to point. Thank you, Ben. So, so here, here uh, we can see right here these, these curved horns and this small base. You know, this is, this is definitely an adult cow. Um, this long face coming here, the afro is not overly large. You know, it's very small relative to a bull. Um, so this would be obviously an adult cow. Um, you can look over here. This, uh, this one on the left, this is also an adult cow. The long face, she's sticking her tongue out at you. Um, she's got these, uh, uh, lesser horns and down here there is no penile sheath available or to be seen on her right here. Um, this animal right here is also a cow. You know more from the the broadside picture of that you can really look in the horns that lesser horn. She's a little hairy but not nearly so hairy with the afro as the uh, uh, um, other ones. So. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so very, very much less woolly than an adult would be. So, um, so these are cows. Now, you can see that there are other bison in the background here. And I believe one of them is likely a bull, but uh, we can't see enough of them to be able to know for sure. So, you are responsible for what you are uh, shooting, so make sure that you shoot the right thing. Um, we've already talked about these, these different indicators on, on the bull. Um, the, the words are unfortunately on top of this, but you can see the penile sheath down here on this adult bull. Um, the horns are much heavier, and you can see that the, uh, the woolly hair is kind of overrunning even the base of the horn here. Um, the goalpost uh, uh, horns and then that very much larger broad uh, broad head. So uh, this is a younger bull here, but you can already see those characteristics. A lot more of the wool, the goal goalpost style horns with the heavy base and, and the mass being brought out there. Um, this is probably a three-year-old bull here, so um, two to three. Um, but you see the face is somewhat triangular versus the long, narrow, sort of boxy, rectangular face of a, of a cow. Um, yeah, so side by, oh, there we go, side by side comparison, the rounded horns um, still has somewhat of the wool, but not the same as the bulls. When you get them side by side, you can really see the difference. Um, both the bulls and the cows have a goatee here, but the bulls are typically more pronounced, but that is not something I would base my shot on. Uh, I would look at the other identifiers. So, OK. 
Okay. This is a large adult bull here. And you can see he's got so big that that horn has kind of uh, turned in almost uh, in that rounded the similar shape to the cow. Uh, so this is possible, but clearly the massive hump, the incredible amount of wool and uh, just the, the mass of the, of the size of the head is very obvious. Uh, you will not uh, ha have any likelihood of mistaking any, a large older adult bull for a, a cow uh, just from the, the massive size of them even with the, uh, the different shape of the horn of this particular bull. Um, but yeah, make sure you get it right. So here's what a yearling bull looks like. Um, the yearling bulls are uh, sort of the uh, outliers of the herd. They, they, they don't fit in, so sometimes they would be more independent and show up at a water hole by themselves even. They may have been ostracized or the, the least one that they care about. The penile sheath is there, but it's very little on this little guy. Hard to tell. Um, much better to look at the goal or the uh, the shape of these horns how the uh, ice cream cone on the head and the hair this animal would be legal for harvest as a yearling um, yearling cows I don't think we have a picture of them side by side but you can see I'll, I'll go I'll try to go back to the last one look at this horn shape of this one you already have some curve in it it's a smaller based horn versus this guy. It's a little straighter and, and bigger diameter at the base. So you can kind of see the difference. Either one of these would be legal for a yearling harvest. Um, but even here, you can see the difference in the head shape between the, the long rectangular face versus the more of a, a pyramidal triangular shaped head. And the, the woolly head is more prominent on the yearling bull than it is on the yearling cow. Hey, Alan, just to add to that, that these animals are legal for a cow only as a cow or a bull also, not just a, a yearling yes, cow. Yes, that's, I'm sorry, I, I might have misled people there, but yeah, yeah, so if you have a cow tag, you can shoot a yearling cow. Uh, if you have a yearling tag, you can shoot a yearling cow or a yearling bull. And if you have a bull tag, you can shoot a adult bull or a yearling bull. So um, here they. Are. I guess we did have one side by side. This uh, bull here is a still a yearling bull, but he is already a full year old. You can see how much that horn has grown um, before from that last one. Again, versus this yearling cow you can see the difference they really start taken off by the the spring of the year after they were were born um, and just you can see those differences in the uh in the wool and the head shape and the horn shape it's uh once you get to looking for those differences it's pretty obvious um, but don't shoot you are strictly liable for what you shoot you shouldn't you have to know what you're shooting at. So if you have a question in your heart, don't pull the trigger until you figure it out. Um, here's a, a picture, again, of the adult bull. You can see how massive the horn is, how massive the, the hump is, the woolly hair. Um, and these uh, two that are in front of him on the left, right here and here, these are, are that same year's calves. This will probably be what the, the calves will look like when you're up there hunting uh, this fall. It will be something of this or even into the spring because of the, the extra hair they have. Uh, to the back here, you've got uh, a yearling bull for sure here and maybe right there. But you can't tell by just one thing. Make sure you're taking a good look at things on the whole, not just on the parts um, to make sure what your shot is. Uh, here's a, a, just a piece of reference, you know, a, a sketch showing these different age classes and sizes, especially with the bulls, um, showing what their horn shape basically typically would look like. Um, and you can see the cow, the mature cow, how much narrower it's drawn. It's because it's that much narrower and it's really a good representation of what that looks like. Um, Aging bison. 
it, at least through where they're about five years old, it's really pretty easy to look at a bison. You just have to get them to smile. The, uh, the yearlings, they will have, uh, they only have lower incisors on the front of their jaw. So if you pull their lip down and you can look at their teeth, if they only have baby teeth, um, then it's a yearling. Um, and then as they start getting older, just like your kids, they start losing those baby teeth and growing in adult teeth. And there's a huge difference in the size between those teeth. And so uh, as this picture is demonstrating, you know, um, when they have both of their middle incisors, that's a two-year-old. When they have um, two of the four middle incisors on each side, so a total of four adult incisors, they're going to be three years old, and uh, so on. Well, I'm having trouble with that thing there. So once they get to be fully adult teeth, then it's a five-plus-year-old animal, and it really gets much harder to determine the age, so it's just going to be you know five or older at that point. Um, you, you know, other things that they would look at would be, you know, how much wear on the back teeth and stuff, but beyond the tooth eruption, it's just a guess as to how old the animal is. Um, are we collecting teeth? No. So, um, there are some other opportunities, some other places to go to look for, uh, some more of this. Uh, Wyoming has put together some things. Utah has put together some presentations that are online and kind of have a practice quiz going through things. Um, it, I've said it a couple times. You, you need to make sure that you do it, that you actually harvest the animal you intend to harvest. Um, that is your once in a lifetime take whether or not you can keep the animal. So make sure you shoot one you can keep. Um, and uh, then also Come uh, come out and enjoy uh, the Raymond Wildlife Area. You have a uh, we have a bison herd that you'll be able to look at and be able to see these differences in person and start to understand really what we're talking about there. Um, if you have the chance to scout at uh, the, up on the North Rim of the Grand Canyon, then for sure take some time to check out uh, the bison up there. Um, hey, hey, Alan, yes. I'll just add um, Kenny Hot is our Raymond Wildlife Area Manager. If anybody wants to contact him to come out to look at the Raymond herd, Kenny can be reached at 928-699-5273. Again, that's 928-699-5273. So. And, uh, yeah, Kenny is a great resource there at Raymond. And Raymond, he can tell you where to go look and... Uh, um, help facilitate you having a good visit out there and, and doing what you need to do. So um, here we have just going to go through like a couple of extra slides here. You know, this is a mature cow, but you can see uh, perhaps this horn got broken a little bit, so it's not quite so obvious. Um, but this is not a good shot to take, although it would be a perfect uh, shooting opportunity if it was not for this little calf that's right behind her. You can just see the feet hanging down from out of her. Um, you need to pay a lot of attention to that. The bullets will pass all the way through uh, a bison sometimes, and uh, and you'd be responsible for that for those second animals that are shot. Um, so, you know, you've got time typically, especially uh, on the uh, kaibab hunts where. Uh, the herd will come in and be drinking, moving around. There will be time for you to take your time to make a good shot. Um, so, you know, and that cow would be legal if that calf was not behind her. Um, you could harvest her even with a young calf. The calves will be fine. We purposefully set our seasons to where the calves won't be uh, impacted by uh, if their mother gets shot. Um, so that's another identifier. If they have a calf, you know they're a cow. Um, but there'll also be cows without calves. So that's another way to, um, you know, if you're concerned about a calf uh, surviving after harvest of a, of, of a mother, um, there will be dry cows up there without calves too. So look for those. Yeah. So... Uh, so this is uh, up on the North Kaibab, and you can see what a herd of bison looks like and uh, how 
in the shadows with all mixed up on top of each other and they were always going to be kind of moving around it makes it uh, uh, it can be a challenge to find that time and that's where you need to take the time to make sure you have the good shot at the animal that you think you're shooting at um, that's not stacked up with another one in the way. Identify legal animals, take your time, and wait for one to clear. And so with that, that is the end of uh, the age and uh, gender presentation. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we did have one question. Uh, we'll go ahead and answer that real quick. Uh, and, and that has to do with when is the best time to go scouting and not impact another hunter's uh, hunt. And we're going to go over that in this, this next section, so hold on to that and I'll get to that. Um, I just wanted to point out, um, just to re re sum up from the last Alan's part on sex and age uh, identifiers, is if you're not sure... Um, you know, don't pull the trigger. Ellen went over that. But also do your homework ahead of time. There are, have been hunters in the blind with animals in front of them. And they do not and cannot identify a legal animal. And they do not shoot. So don't let that be one of you. Or let that happen to you. Know your animals. Know your identifiers. You can print out that um, hunter packet. And take it with you, sitting in the blind, review that. It's all in there on the, on the sex and aging, all those identifiers. Yes, go ahead, Ben. We have a call. We have a call. Okay, Ben's going to give us a call, and uh, we'll go ahead and take that. Uh, I'm sorry, it looked like he hung up. Oh, okay, false call. So, okay. Um... We'll get to the next section, and that's actually the techniques of the hunting up there on the Kaibab. Okay, so scouting and hunting. Um, just a little bit, it's a rare opportunity uh, to hunt bison um, anywhere in the, in the country, let alone Canada. Um, the, the, the range of bison is from northern Mexico up into Canada and Alaska. Uh, rare hunting opportunity. Uh, most states don't have permits available on free-ranging bison um, they're usually on uh, private ranches where you can go so it's a unique opportunity um, Alaska has it Utah Wyoming Arizona it's a once-in-a-lifetime harvest in Arizona and just to go over that a little bit what that means it's a lifetime harvest and it does not matter whether that's a legal harvest or illegal harvest. So again, that's getting back to identify that animal before you pull the trigger. Um, and I think we, we got a slide to go over that too. All right, so it's an adventure. Kaibab hunts are different than any other hunt in the state. Any different than um, you know, all, any other big game hunt, they're just different and I'll, we're gonna go over why. So, the North Kaibab is, is a, a unique place. It's a um, pretty remote. There is no cell coverage in most of it. Off the points, off the edges, the east and west, you can get some cell service. Or down at the North Rim, um, Grand Canyon National Park in the village there, you get internet, or not internet, uh, cell phone coverage there. Uh, so it's uh, remote. It is solitude. It's it's uh, almost untouched up there. It's a it's a unique place at 9,000 foot, where um, at least on the summer hunts, where you'll be. Okay, it can be tough mentally, physically. It can be hot. It can be cold. It can be wet, dry, muddy, snowy, all of them in the same week. Um, the weather is unpredictable at those elevations up there, so be prepared. Um, for all these conditions So there is I just want to point out um, on page 49 of the current fall hunting regulations the Kaibab Bi Plateau Bison special note Okay, a significant portion of the original house rock herd has moved on the Grand Canyon National Park where hunting is not allowed Hunters are advised that their ability to successfully harvest a bison may be significantly impacted 
as in any hunt circumstances beyond the control of the Arizona Game and Fish Department and the Commission um, may prevent the permit holder from being successful. The Department and the Commission disclaims any responsibility to reissue or replace permits, to reinstate bonus points, to refund any fees, um, or to provide any other form of relief. An example of that just occurred in this current hunt. Right now, where the Kaibab National Forest, well, all forest in the state were closed to entry, um, and the first 10 days or so of the current hunt, they couldn't get in. Many hunters were, were concerned about not being able to go in, not being able to go. Um, some utilized their, um, their point guard, turned their tags in, and um, others had not, and um, thankfully we got the rain, and the hunt opened up and they got they got like four animals in the first several days up there and a couple more since um anyway those type of situations um the commission has made it clear they will not refund the tag so just be prepared uh, for any type of conditions up there and um hopefully you will be in a place where the animals will come in some days will be like this. This is Highway 67, a view of a herd. Um, there'll be days like this. Uh, hopefully this will be your, your opening morning. You'll have a herd in front of you. Uh, others have waited all season till the very last um, light and seen a herd finally come in. Others don't see a herd. That's just the, the way it goes on these hunts. All right, you can have days like this. Obviously this is a winter hunt. This is not gonna be happening uh, anytime too soon up there but be prepared um those first spring hunts and the bull hunts you may um need to get in by snowmobile or um over snow travel um, we have dropped back the hunt starting in 2022 um not opening till april so there is no january february um march open season up there for the next couple of years, um, there hasn't been any bison harvested during those time frames. And I'll show you a picture or a map of um, locations of bison, and you'll see why we did that. Okay, you can get flat tires. Again, be prepared for um, vehicle issues. Um, you can have trees fall down any time of year with the current wet conditions up there and the wind and any... Um, burst of any thunderstorm you can have trees even in the summertime falling down behind you so i would recommend taking a chainsaw to be able to remove these trees um, to get in and out of these locations if necessary hopefully you won't even need them uh, other types of communication like an in reach or satellite phone is recommended also all right so be prepared have a backup plan bring enough food and water for the whole hunt a chainsaw, I already talked about that. Trees can fall all year long. Uh, spare tires and fuel cans. Um, like I say, you can go down on Grand Canyon National Park, you pay that entrance fee, you can go down there for that seven days, covers most of your, your upcoming hunts, time frame. Um, you know, GPS to help you get, along, get around. There's also what most people have gone to, and it's a, a useful app, is on your cell phone of like Onyx or Flatland and they track you without even having a um, connection. Um, bring extra batteries, make sure you can charge those uh, devices if you're gonna rely on them. Okay, enough warm clothes, dress in layers, can be cold in the mornings, evenings, even the, in the summertime after a thunderstorm, those temperatures up there can drop down into the 40s. Bring your rain gear. Um, said no, no cell service up there, satellite phone and in reach. Um, GPS would be recommended. You can communicate. Satellite phone is good to communicate. Then you can call um, Grand Canyon National Park if for some reason an animal that you have shot has gotten onto the park. Okay, uh, tools, um, to, me mechanic tools to work on your truck if you need to. Um, tires, tire chains would be in the springtime recommended, um, possibly late, late uh, November, December hunts also toe straps in case you break down high lift jacks are a great tool um, the star wrenches to get those tires those flats off and change them out okay also have an emergency plan talk with your family let your spouses know 
uh, where you intend to be and when you will get a hold of them. Many times they will call us if you don't meet those deadlines and we will come searching, um, looking for you to find you. That's another good reason to communicate with the other hunters up there. In case you break down, they know where you are going to be or where you were hunting and they can come look for you also. Like I said, that area is remote. All right, so maps, applications you can use, like I said, uh, GPS, um, cell phone maps, um, like Flatline and Onyx, Kaibab National Forest map, which you see in just the North uh, Kaibab Ranger District map. Um, there's a, a, a map. Um, not sure this one has as much applicability as the first two. Um, but you might find some information on our, our uh, AZ Access Maps on the Game of Fish website. There's also the Kaibab Travel Management Map. Those are, um, again, less useful as the top two in getting around. All right, so where are these bison at? Where do you want to spend the time? Where are you going to see them? This is a map from back in 2014. These are actually uh, a group of animals that we caught on Grand Canyon National Park. Transported them down to House Rock Wildlife Area to see what they would do. We held them overnight. That's right here in the crowds at House Rock Wildlife Area. That six After dark, 6 o'clock at night, um, we opened the gates after we fed them. Uh, the next morning at 6 a.m., the next reading, they were up here by John's tank. So they did headed uh, overnight back to the top where they came from. So, Carl, how many months were they down there at House Rock before they... Yeah, we tried to see what they would do just to know what that behavior was. And we, we tried to acclimate them for five months. We held them in a crowd down there and fed them. And um, they liked the top better, surprisingly. Or not surprising, I should say. But um, then they went on to the park. So this was a couple years then that of that cow, that group, or where they traveled. Um, these locations here would be wintertime. Down here, wintertime. These are summertime locations where they're bumping off. And this is about typical. They don't go very far north of Grand Canyon National Park. But they do come off the forest. Here's some other. Um, each color represents a different animal in there. This is also from 2014 and 15. And this is by month of where, actually, this is the same, same group um, and where they were by month. Um, and I got some other more updated photos here or, or maps. So this is uh, August of um, 2020 of 14 animals that were collared where they went. So if you look right in here um, about this dog leg of the park and forest boundary, a little bit to the west and, and over, um, you'll see this is about John's tank. Does it show it here? These animals weren't going there. Um, this is this is going to be spare tank over here, on the to the southwest or southeast, rather. But most of them are right in here. This is the heart of the rut. So I would I would say, and I got a, I believe there's another map coming up to show this um, of um, 2021 locations. I will just wait till we get there and talk about. It. So here's October. Um, excuse me, September of 2020 locations. They start to come off more post-rut. They start venturing more, more north of the park. Um, you can see all these locations up here on the forest. These are all locations that'll be, um, we have some GPS coordinates of some salt locations and water locations here. Again, here's John's tank, they're coming off here. Here's a spare tank over here. We got those map locations for you. Okay, so this is March of this year, winter range. You can see the bison are down, they winter um, on the edge of Grand Canyon National Park. Deep, mostly deep in the park. This is probably a bull up here. He had spent some time up in here on, on these points, up the Paraswampets Fire Point, but mostly on the park, and those bulls will come off about in this area and winter on the park for the most part. So that's the reason why we, we um, took away those three months, January, February, March, starting next year, that there's just really no animals available, and none have been harvested except for one cow when it was uh, any 
uh, bison tag, I believe in 2017, the last bull that was harvested in those three months was back in 2014. So rather than you guys going up, trying to get in and wasting time, wasting leave time away from work, um, when there's no animals available, uh, the season has just been shifted back to April. All right, so with that, where are you gonna concentrate? Um, and this map will show it. There's a spare tank. This is actually probably in the fall. There's not much right now going out the spare tank and hasn't been much, but in the fall, cow groups start coming hitting this spare tank country. They'll hit up here to John's or right along the boundary in between them. Um, this is mostly for the uh, meadows up to DeMont Park. In here, um, not really so much up in this country in here. They're pretty tight and using these drainages to come on and off. Um, right in this area in here is a good location, multiple locations in there where animals are being harvested, salts and waters, uh, out to the 268 road um, over here on the west side um, in here. So anywhere in that area close to the boundary is all good. Here's the waters we have mapped out up there. These are pretty much full-time areas. Um, like say John's tank, these are west side um, photos, but getting out here in 268, um, the 268A uh, trick tank, um, South Big Springs, 270G, um, the 270Q water. Um, I wouldn't worry about these two. I'm not sure there's even salts there anymore. John's tank is, is a good one. I wouldn't waste time at, at Sourdough or Crystal. They just don't go up that far anymore. And then here's the east side with a spare tank down here good fall location late september october post rut there are some cow groups that go out there um, john's tank these areas up here down on the house rock wildlife area so don't worry about those burn tank does not hold water except right after snow melt in the spring so i wouldn't worry about that um and again here's some this one i wouldn't worry about i don't think that one's been replaced in a couple of years um here's these locations again so Alan's put this table together um, based upon what uh, GPS coordinates you want or need of, of these different areas on the east side, on the west side uh, of all those locations. So take a look at that. That is also in the hunter packet for you. Okay, so what are you going to see? What's the, what's the National Forest boundary going to look like? If you look back in this photo right there, there's a bull standing there safely on the park right here is a typical look of the national park forest boundary fence line it's not real distinctive it's not always marked and always have a sign but that's what it's going to be like so here's a more open spot here's a photo uh, to forest national park um, nps signs and that's what they'll look like um, Go back to that. It'll say NPS boundary, I believe, is what this sign says. So anytime there's a sign about where you're at, and if you're tracking and using those those uh, cell phone maps, that will show you about where the boundary is. So start looking for down wire, T post, or these signs to identify where that boundary is. Do not go on the park; they will um, cite you. <clears throat> Again, here's a, a vertical sign, uh, United States Department of Interior. Boundary Line National Park Service. And then here's another one. So different different type of signs to mark that. But there's all, most of it will have T-post and, and down uh, uh, bob wire on it. So look for that. So factors affecting hunt success. Obviously rain, um, snow. Um, the drier the conditions, the greater the harvest is when it's drier up there so three or four days starts to dry up those those um road puddles uh up there and uh, it'll side ranges to go back to the main waters and they'll start coming back into those main ones so human disturbance such as road hunting road hunting you will not be successful on these animals maybe maybe 0.01 percent of the hunters and that's the springtime, driven the road and seeing it, and animals, they won't stop. They're pretty wild animals, as wild as elk or more so. They will not, 
they hear a vehicle approaching and they will run and they will go back to the park boundary so if you think um i just say the road hunting will not be effective um some have been okay doing uh you know walking the NPS nps boundary you're more likely to spook them and um it's better just to let them approach you on a quiet uh on their own terms to these locations and um another thing don't do is, is to run the herd off after a kill i think we got some more information on that coming up so shot placement is extremely important caliber choice is not as much as the shot placement so we'll go over that a little bit more uh, it's got some diagrams of their skeletal um and uh, show you where to shoot so uh, do not travel on closed roads obey the the signs there on the forest do not camp by the park boundary most people will camp in the junction of forest road 270 223 and 269 there's there's multiple sites in there to camp pull a trailer or tents whatever your prefer preference is uh, some have also camped in there or used the uh, trailer uh, cabins or the campground at DeMont also, but most 90%, uh, 98% probably use, use or camp along those, those three roads. And there's plenty of uh, pullout sites there. Okay, went over that. Okay, when you're going to a hunt location, when you have that, don't drive up to it, especially during the hunt or, or while scouting. Park a quarter mile to a third from that location and then walk in. And be quiet don't be talking there could be animals there um, and you can get a shot um, potentially harvest first thing in the morning or last at night hunt your way in and hunt your way out is what we say all right so scouting you can get back to that question we had earlier okay trail cameras are legal for the rest of 2021 starting January 1st they will no longer be allowed in Arizona to take wildlife or to assist in locating animals for taking wildlife for the fall uh, most sites already have cameras up and um, like I said in the co-op um, that um, anybody wants that information we can get that to you too just just give us a call or um, email us we'll give you um, what that co-op is if you want to do that uh, like I said walk in rather than drive up to those waters and salts um, if a truck is going to be in that quarter mile to a third of a mile away from that location assume somebody is there but if there's no vehicle there does it necessarily mean nobody's there because somebody could have got dropped off but if there's no vehicle there um you know assume there may not be anybody there and you can go down and check things out um go up to a blind just be quiet um and uh, if nobody's there then you can take your time and, and, and look around and gps it if you like and see if you want to set up your own blind or or um, where the trails are and that type of stuff so talk to other hunters if you know any uh, share your information that you've learned with other hunters following you um, you can scout a day or so before your hunt there's no nobody hunting no open season the day before all these fall hunts or even in the spring and um, you can go out there without disturbing anybody or and that's also towards the tail end of the hunt before yours there'll be less likely to be people in the field there'll be a few hunters left but um, if you're going up on a say opening weekend of a hunt you can be pretty assured that every hunter in that hunt's going to be in the field um, you can also use google earth learn those meadows learn those sites um put them on your onyx and uh, those locations that alan had put together and um, you can use google earth and go in the meadows on the park and you can actually see bison in those meadows in there all right so things to do to increase success and your experience they say share contact information in the field in the camps um there are usually pretty close um, proximity on those camp locations so just let people know where you're going to be what you intend to do and if you harvest let them know that you harvested and that you'll be pulling out and that anybody else is welcome to go into that site again so communicate with each other during the hunt 
coordinate efforts. Share what you are, where you're going to go hunt. Um, nobody knows where you are, and they can't help you either. They can't help you if, you if your vehicle breaks down. So help each other retrieve animals in the field. Usually there's um, multiple people sitting in camp would, would, um, wanting something to do. It gets boring just sitting in camp on these hunts. So build, uh, find uh, you know, new friendships. Get a new hunting buddy or just, just um, um, you know, communicate with, with those hunters in there. It, it can pay off for you. Okay, respect each other, either they're hunters or non-hunters. Grand Canyon attracts tourists from all over the world. Your actions represent all hunters, both positively and negatively. So you're representing, you know, hunters to a non -hunt, potentially non-hunters out there, especially in along the meadows of Highway 67. Just be aware of, of your actions and how you represent hunters as a whole, and that may be the only interaction they have. If it's a negative, they have a negative view. That can impact um, voting and how support um, or non-support for conservation programs. All right. You can set up your blind. You're free to bring up your own blinds. Set up your own blinds. And um, if there's a blind that nobody's in there, um, you know, and you're coordinating with other hunters, and you can, you can sit in that blind. But if somebody comes in, and it's their blind, and they are intending to use it, you will have to vacate that um, blind unless you have your own. If two of you want to set the same area, you can work that out. You know, you can do paper, rock, scissors, who, who shoots first, or whatever. Take times. Um, you know, the AM, I'll shoot first. The PM, you shoot first. I'll share the area with you. Like I said, there's multiple cows that will come into a location. Um, and you can each harvest an animal. Um, Bull hunters, they may come in by themselves or in small bachelor groups. Um, so you can still share locations. It's open. To, there's no reservations. Okay, just went over that. Um, like I said, that, that, that the most that I'm aware of that have been harvested and during, out of one herd was five uh, animals over about a two-hour time frame where... But several of these sites are close together. You'll hear shots from somebody else. And um, other hunters had come in to that location. I, well, my guess was that they, they shot a lead cow and the rest of the group didn't know what to do. And um, they harvested five out of that group. So what is the hunt like? Most effective is sitting salt and water locations um, if you can stand it. Plan on being in the blind, um, you know, first to last light. I would hunt in in the morning and hunt out in the morning. So save yourself a little bit of time so that in case it, you encounter a group on the way in or out, you can um, take advantage of it. Don't have to. Some people have thought they had to be in the blind to shoot. No. <laughs> take advantage of it whenever you can. All right. This is to be the hardest part part of the hunt some people can take it some people can't um, it's the long sit um, you got the pop-up blinds for scent control hide your movements and noises um, I've heard stories where people are milling around in the in the blind and scare herds as they're coming in so be quiet just be they're they're not dumb animals they're they will retreat back to the park very quickly um, so just be quiet, have everything you need in there and ready to go for in the case they, when a herd comes in. Bring books, you can watch movies, um, just bring extra batteries, um, you can read and do stuff to help pass the time. Comfortable chairs, <laughs> long sit, um, comfortable chair is important. Then use a rest. Have a rest like a tripod or a um, shooting sticks to help shoot from, help steady that shot. Study those um, identifiers, pick out a legal animal, and make that first shot count. And enough food and water for the day. Okay, I already talked about hunting your way in and out. So, so what is the bison So, scale Carl, one other thing there is uh -huh. uh, to help with that endurance. Um, 
is to bring a buddy with you into the blind. You know, you don't want to be talking to them because the, the bison will hear the voices and, and know. But uh, we had that instance where a hunter couldn't handle the uh, uh, the long sit all day. He decided to take a nap. And while he was asleep, uh, the bison herd came in, watered, and left. And he never got to see him at all. If he had a buddy to help uh, stay on watch for him when he was taking a nap, he would have shot a bison. And he went home empty-handed. You can imagine there's all kinds of stories like that up to run the whole gamut. So here's what a, a bison skeleton is going to look like. Their heart sits down low in their chest. We recommend the heart shot. You take out that pump. You take out um, oxygen to the, brain, to the brain. They will die quickly. Um, many animals, are, they, they just go down in their tracks or won't go more than 10 yards with a lethal heart shot. Double lung shot, still good. They don't go that far, um, but they will travel even with a double lung shot, more so than um, a heart shot. We don't recommend shooting um, the brain stem. Pretty narrow target. Uh, the heart and lungs is a much bigger target, especially when you're excited. So what we do, we look for what we say in the hunts that we've been on, on the wildlife areas, guiding hunters, look for this elbow right here protruding. Look for that more pronounced on the cows. We've got pictures of what it looks like. Look for that and you want to shoot right behind that. You get back even very far back into here, you're going to hit in the diagram or into the stomach area and they will go back to park and you will not retrieve those animals. They will go a long ways. Um, so take out that heart and lung, and um, they go down pretty quick. So again, on a bull, especially when a spring, um, and this is probably a late spring picture, uh, you see some of the old winter coats still on here, there's a lot of hair um, that's going to really hide that. So another way to look at that is, is about, in, about that hairline is going to be behind the elbow. You're even back here a few inches, you're going to hit that that. Um, out of that heart and lung and you're going to look about six to eight inches up from the bottom if you can't really identify that elbow off the bottom um, horizontal plane there up it would be a good good location to to shoot okay already went over that the heart and lung sit low it's about the size of a football aim behind the elbow um, and again six to eight inches off the bottom of the chest so on a cow, not near as much hair, that elbow area much more pronounced there. So right behind that elbow, you'll get right into that lethal area. Um, that's going to change a little bit if you visualize this leg forward. You got more of that area available to you versus if it's back, you're going to have that shoulder and those, those big bones in there to have to go through to get in there um, versus straight down. You can still get in there pretty good. Um, so just wait for that, that good opportunity. Well, one oh. other point for about shot placement. You know, most, most of our hunters know where the rifle hits at 200 yards, 300 yards. You know, these shots are very close range, 30 yards, 50 yards. And, and we, you don't want to make that mistake of not knowing where your rifle shoots on the close end of the spectrum. Um, most of the mistaken shots we've had at the wildlife areas are people shoot too high or they shoot a little too far back and uh, um, if you shoot in the middle of the body elevationally from the from the sternum to the top of the backbone you're not going to recover that animal either you have to shoot him low and know exactly where your bullet's going to fly at close range said you, and, and it is possible to hit too low uh, if you hit um that bottom of the sternum, they're going to go a long way. So make sure you get it up off the bottom too, but not not too high, um, or because that heart and lungs is, is visualize that bottom half of, of that whole um, animal, especially on a bull from top to bottom. All right. So if you hit an animal, you know whether it is down or not, that herd will surround that animal very quickly. Um, and that animal will likely disappear in the herd. You may not be able to see that animal, see what's really going on. They like to lick that wound. They know that animal is wounded. Sometimes it's a hierarchy 
and that, if that was a dominant animal, the subdominant animals are now going to gang up on that one and get back. And, and, and they're always fighting over dominance in the herd, um, especially um, bulls during the rut. Um, the bulls more so than the cows, but the cows they'll still surround. Um, and that's where a having a buddy or friend with you in the blind can help you look for animals too. So, very important, do not shoot again unless you are positive of which animals you hit. If you don't know, don't shoot again. You don't want to shoot two out of there. You'll usually see an animal limping or some sort of um, injury. Animals licking, you can see blood dripping off the, the end of those hairs in that vital area if you made a good hit. If you hit that heart and lung, they're usually on the ground within 30 seconds. Then it's obvious which one you hit. Um, if you know for sure which ones you hit, um, then shoot it again. So be patient. Let the herd leave on their own. Um, if the animal is wounded, um, if you get out after you shot and one's wounded, it may walk off and leave with the herd. So be patient. Um, let that let that damage that occurred from that initial shot let it take its. Uh, take its effect on that animal. Okay, if it's wounded and walking towards the park, I would recommend take your best available shot. They will not allow you to move to the side of them to get another shot. They will keep their butt towards you. Um, we've seen that on the wildlife areas time and time again. Um, if it's gonna go back to the park with a possible loss, you may not have another opportunity. I would take, um, you know, try to knock out the back end that pelvis area hit high you're going to have some meat damage in there but that's better than than going home without an animal too um, if that, and again that's just wounded and walking away and you have no other opportunity you know that's your wounded animal and um, you take the best shot you can uh, radios if they're available you can share with others um, to communicate um, if you have a bison down, the herd sticks around, you can call in and communicate with another hunter if you have that ability. And those that participate, like I said, in that hunter co-op um, will be, are, are my understanding, provided with radios where they can communicate with each other too. So <clears throat> just one other thing to mention there, um, like if you, well two things I guess. Is if you make a good hit on a bison through the heart or the lungs, you will know it. They will hump up, jump up. There will be some physical reaction that they do. If you shoot them too high or too far back, um, it, they might have got a mosquito bite. You know, they, they won't even make a, a response sometimes. You'll just see where the dust comes off of their side. Um, and then secondly is uh, blood trailing a bison. Uh, they're fur is essentially a, a sponge and uh, trying they will not bleed out to the ground very much they're a very difficult animal to try to uh, to locate so take the time to make that good shot so you don't have to look for them and with that shot that's where a buddy sitting with you you identify the animal you're, you're gonna shoot he can see where that animal gets hit and knows about um, where to look for an injury or blood that may or may not show up. If you get a hit too far back, you, there may not be any blood at all, and they don't even react hardly. So um, here's another identifier for you. You might see a broken horned cow. Obviously, this is a cow, woolly, less woolly appearance, rounded, uh, mature cow, not very um, thick here at the base. On there. So anyway, Alan's going to talk about once you have an animal down, what do you do? Hey, Carl, one second. Would you just uh, reiterate um, the best time to go scouting? That way you're not messing up uh, or having impact on others. We would recommend, if you don't, if you've never been to the Kaibab, it's a good idea to go up there. You can go up there anytime. Um, just, you can, it's good to know the main roads the 22 road, Highway 67, how you get into the area, 223, uh, 268, where those roads are at. 
those main roads will not the locations will be off of those those hunting locations so you can um, you know stop in and talk to hunters that are there in the field too uh, where they're at not the hunters the, the, the anybody that may be in a camp rather see how the hunts going where's the activity and um, you know get, gather your your intel that way uh, like I said a few days before your hunt if you're comfortable with that, get up there a few days early. That will save you gas and time um, um, of scouting from an, a separate drive up there. You can learn that there's not too many hunters in the field at that time left. Um, that's the, or, or, or at any time, you can still go up there, learn those main roads, talk to other hunters uh, or people that are in camp, and um, they'll, they'll likely share... Um, the locations and GPS locations too. You can go up there anytime, like I said, too, and scout other than just the main roads, look for the locations. And, um, but if there's a vehicle parked there where, um, say, a GPS is telling you a location is, stay away from it. Just assume a hunter's there then. All right. <clears throat> so, You've been successful. You harvested a bison. It's laying there, and you start to realize the magnitude of the job you just inherited. Um, what about now? What do we do? So there's, you know, planning ahead for uh, forewarned is forearmed. Um, bison hair is extremely um, wire-like, and it will dull your blade very quickly. Um, so you know. Try to bring extra blades for you know, Havilon type knives, uh, sharpeners, you know, some, you know, multiple knives. You know, just, you're going to, you're going to be wishing you did if you don't. I had to uh, gut and skin one once with a Leatherman, and that was just a nightmare. So, um, game bags. Keep, taking care of the meat is vital. That's what you're there for. That's, uh... The most important part and there's a lot of meat bring a lot of different game bags um you know just it's a lot easier to grab onto a bag than try to bring out cuts of meat on their own um and it keeps flies and stuff away from it something to put your stuff on to keep it from getting all full of you know blood and crud and other stuff um and you, know, you can also use a tarp as a shade uh if you don't want to bring your own shade you know uh, uh, if you're having to hike in, <clears throat> a easy up may not be a, a real, you know, great choice. But if you can be close to the vehicle, it might be an excellent choice. Um, bison uh, meat spoils quickly, and it's just miserable to be hunkered down in the sun uh, when it's uh, uh, trying to deal with it uh, without any kind of break sometimes. Um, and then ice chests. You need lots of ice chests and lots and lots of ice um, if you're going to go that route. Uh, it is available at the North Rim store or at Jacobs Lake or I believe at the Grand Canyon uh, if you're up there. Um, but it is uh, an important part is how do we deal with that. The freezer generator thing, or we've seen a lot of people anymore using those utility trailers with a chest freezer and uh, hooking up a generator to it and keeping it, uh, keeping them cold that way. Um, so lots of different things people figured out for how to do that um, in the field, but uh, um, make sure that, you know, our bison hunts aren't exactly in the same time as deer hunts and elk hunts. Um, sometimes a, uh, a meat processor may be full of elk and not able to take your bison. So, so have a plan. Talk to the uh, um, processors you want to use before so that they know what to expect. And then when you're coming from the field, make sure that they know that you're showing up as well um, so they're not surprised. It, it makes your, your situation a lot better that way. Um, so you can see uh, this bison here that this, uh, this girl harvested. Just the head of that bison, I'm sure, weighs more than she weighs. Um, uh, it's a uh, you can see how much she's actually struggling just to hold it up for the picture right there um, So bring you know eat your Wheaties and Because uh, <laughs> you're gonna be pulling some big heavy things around um, So this uh, the gutless method that's uh, become more and more popular 
and there's a lot of benefits to it. You know, you lay the animal down on one side, you can remove all the meat from the one side, makes it a lot easier to flip it over, skin the other side, and, and uh, do that. Um, if you're packing a bison out of the field, that uh, you're looking at about 150 to 250 pounds worth of bone if you're going to pack out like the entire carcass. Um, I'd rather leave that bones out there to uh, then pack that extra weight out. Um, and that's why we say that this is uh, um, the best method there. A couple things to point out there on this, this photo. Um, we look in the back, they got two animals down. So two hunters uh, work together on that herd. Uh, in the background, the upper left is a T post. That is the park boundary. You see how close and tight that is. On the right, you can see a trail. Um, those trails are pretty pronounced where they come and go from the park too. Yeah. And uh, this is a very common scenario of that being right on the boundary fence. And, and that just reiterates the importance of a making a great shot because it doesn't take too many steps to get over that boundary and then you have to deal with park service and uh, and their response so um, it is possible for a person to uh, hoist them up into a tree but uh, you know you consider the the weight of a bison and the equipment it takes to do this uh, even if you uh, flex both arms you can't just hoist it up there with a gamble like you did with a, a deer or something um, so you're looking at in, involving a lot of extra risk and extra uh, equipment to make this work um, again that uh, on the ground can be a better uh, can be a better method for most people especially if they have to hike in anywhere um, keeping the meat in the shade and cool keeping the people cool that are working on it uh, that can be a big deal uh, even with cool temperatures, you're up on the, you know, 9,000 feet if you're at the up on the Kaibab, and it can be extremely hot um, and uh, rainy and snowy and other things. So, figuring out shelter while you're doing this can be a can be a good deal. So, and uh, removing all edible portions. Um, you know, that's you know going back to the wastage, wanton wastage of, of meat. And there is, Carl, do you know what the minimum requirement they have to take out is? I know it's all edible portions, but. Uh... Uh, not off the top of my head. It has changed in the last five years. It is yeah. posted in the regulations, but yeah. um, I don't remember exactly what it states. Okay. So the you know, long and short of it, though, is you went up there to harvest the bison for the meat. Um, and the opportunity everything but take the meat home with you um, so a bison skull can weigh 50 pounds or more uh, some of those big bulls are definitely more um, you know they can take a couple of guys to really move it and put it into a truck um, you might be looking at uh, you know right here 200 pounds for the hide when it's just uh, fresh so that's you're looking at a whole lot there um, and uh, you know, for hair slippage, for spoiling things, you know, um, it's best to not do anything without first consulting your taxidermist, and do whatever do whatever your taxidermist tells you to do. Um, but uh, um, you definitely want to get things cool, or else if you're going to tan the hide um, and it stays hot, then you're going to have a piece of leather, not a not a hide. All the hair will slip off. Um, it is a lot of hard work. There is uh, um, probably no harder bit of field dressing you'll do, even uh, like trying to roll a bison over from his right side to his left side. I mean, you're going to really have to put some effort into it to get them to flip over that, that big hump on their back. But um, you end up with a awesome once-in-a-lifetime kind of a, a keepsake with the, with the mount or the skull or the rug, whatever you do with it. Um, it's worth it and you'll be working with other people up there they're doing the same thing you know if you get help from other hunters make some lifelong friends out of this and uh, it can be a, a really awesome experience for you so yeah one one other point I'll make there um, Alan had mentioned removing those those like especially the femur you want to pack that out but if you're close to 
a road you can drive to it some have just slipped the whole animal into a vehicle or a trailer um, just not only for the weight but also to help cool that meat off you want to you want to debone those big bones especially in the hind quarters to allow air to flow to get um, cool air down in there they can spoil overnight if you don't get that meat cooled off And so, yeah, with that, uh, just another picture of that uh, bison hide. And the, you want to go over that, or you want me to? Um, let's let Carl go over this. This is his thing. Um, and uh, all right, just real quickly, I said we'd we'd get back to this of what this hide represents. It does represent uh, the history of bison in North America. So a little bit about that. This big bull here um, represents. Uh, settlement period bison herds numbered in the tens of millions across the plains from north uh, Canada I mean excuse me north Mexico up in the Canada Alaska between the plains bison and wood bison represents strong uh, healthy herds then the die-off decimation um, those uh, individuals back in the 1800s thought those herds were inexhaustible that's what these skulls represent, death. Um, they went from, from possibly over 50 million total to less, about 750 total of plains bison and wood bison combined um, that were left and saved from extinction. And that's what these two, these animals up here, these are the ones that went through the death and destruction. These two groups here and of those they're separated some of them and many of them that were um, saved from the die-off were crossed with cattle um, was what this represents these trails leading to the cow through the cow now they're crossed um, they had many of them been back bred to bison but they still have detectable levels of cattle dna within them and that's most of the herds in north america today have that detectable level of cattle DNA from that that history top herd fewer represents animals that hadn't been crossed there are some that have never don't do not have detectable levels of cattle DNA in them you see these two herds so from this bigger herd with cattle to this herd and with the trails trailing over here down to these two animals here in Arizona depicted um, where Arizona would be on this map of uh, on the bison hide in the southwest United States. One of these represents the uh, house rock herd. As you can see, most of those animals come through um, cattle crossing from Jones. And that's the animals that are up on the North Kaibab. That's the North Kaibab um, animals. There is also... Um, two trails coming from animals that have not been crossed. One of those goes to Raymond Wildlife Area. Those animals now are a lineage of animals from Wind Cave National Park, and they do not have detectable levels of cattle. Also, we have another trail that coming down to House Rock Wildlife Area. That's the new herd that we have from American Prairie Reserve in Northwest, excuse me, Northeast Montana do not have detectable levels of cattle DNA in them. So the two, um, so there's really about three herds now that we have. House Rock Wildlife Area that has um, no detectable um, cattle DNA, also Raymond, and then the, the north um, up on the Kaibab Plateau. That's the animals. Um, they still look like bison, they act like bison. They're very wild as we have gone over. But this story, this depicts the history and the story, um, similar to what the um, you know the Plains Indians used to do to record their history. I just want to point out that this hide was was thought up and um, was the brainchild of of Jan Taylor, and she painted this hide for us as the artist, and she did an incredible job. So with that, do we have any remaining questions? We got we can take them by phone and by chat. And Austin says we do. Yeah, we have one question from Joaquin. Uh, he wants to know: Is there a list of hunters in my hunt that 
he may be able to find that way he can reach out for communication we I've collected emails and phone numbers and sent those out in the past and, and good question Joaquin um, we found out that that list and contacts were shared with guides and guides were contacting hunters unsolicited guides can no longer contact the department and get the full list of the hunters um, so in order to prevent the misuse of your personal information and being contacted by people you don't want them to contact you we have made that decision not to put a list together um, I have sent out that email to you guys that's a blind um, email list you can communicate through that if you choose to um, just tell which um, you can you can respond on that and say hey anybody that's in this hunt number in October or whichever the case may be you can try reaching out that way but we really don't want those your personal information being used in ways that that was not intended so we've made that decision like I said not to not to collect those anymore okay I'm not sure either you may not be able to reply on a blind CC to everybody I'm not sure how that works um, that's the first time I've done it that way but um, that was just like I said to protect your um, personal information um, and we had uh, hunters that did not want to be contacted by some guides um, contacting them unsolicited this year yeah um, Alan says if we just want to talk a little bit more about the co-op um, I think I've covered that that pretty well if you have any questions on that um, give me a call uh, let me go back to our contact um, information here here it is so talk to Alan would talk to me either one of us also down here I'll point out there is a bison hunt at AZGFD we we asked the, our IT people to create that the other day it may not be up yet by hopefully this coming week it will be up if you want to email us at that um, that will go to um, all three of us here of, of uh, myself Alan and Sam and we'll answer your question and um, another way is that people show up to to communicate uh, getting back to Joaquin's question they show up the day before the hunt um, everybody most everybody will be in that 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 270 223 269 road junction and and go around and meet and introduce yourself that way too any other questions we have that was the only one all right Ben do we have any call-in questions all right um, like thank you uh, everybody that, that that joined us today um, got done a little quicker than we thought but if there are any questions um, feel free to give us a call we'll, we'll share with you uh, everything that we know about there to help you be successful um, the, the, the we had another question just come in Carl okay um, Matt asks so by co-op do you mean Russ Russ Jacoby is an ADAPT um, adventures yes he runs a co-op up there like I said if you choose to do that that's that's fine we have no recommendation as a department up there uh, for any guides or, or anything like that we just want to present the information um, most transparent up there so yes then uh, another question just came in from Bronson uh, lead free ammo any suggestions as to probably where to purchase it that sort of thing yes on the slide here that I have up you got Austin's contact information there um, you can call him or email him uh, with your caliber and what you want um, like I said what we went over is right now we're just looking at the October um and november hunts that's when most of the condors are back on the north kaibab and um just due to the um 
difficulty of getting ammo. We do have a supply available that Austin has. So he's got a list of what we have available. So it'd be best to contact Austin and, and he can tell you what he can do and or maybe be able to get some shipped to you. Um, but just contact him and and um, we'll do our best to, to get non-lead ammo to, to your hands. Anything else? Guess not. So again, thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to call us. Good luck on your hunts.